it's that time and um, for those tuning in online I want to welcome you a good morning and uh, thank you for choosing New Spirit Church uh, for your place to study uh, last week we've been uh, we've been starting a new series uh, in the book of Joshua and uh, actually the last two weeks we've been kind of going through uh, the book uh, and uh, I felt God put this study in my heart for me to to bring to, to you guys because I think there's a lot to be learned you know, we, we explore and we read more about the life of Joshua who he was and really the, the, the call that he had over his life and of course um, we're going to get into more of that today but um, like always um, I want to just lift up our um, you know our church in prayer um, and of course um, our nation as well um, but in the meantime um, for those who are here um, Thank you all for, for making the time out of your busy schedule to, to make it. But uh, I know it can be challenging and be difficult, but we press on and, you know, God continues to call us to be uh, faithful to him. And uh, again, uh, for those who are online, I wanted to say thank you as well. Uh, but like always, I want to open up the word, uh, the study with the word of prayer. Uh, Lord Father, we come to you this morning just grateful for the opportunity us to meet together and for us to study your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you give us the words, give me the words to speak your truth and for uh, allow your spirit to be in your house today, Lord. Uh, Lord, we, we lift all these things up to your name, Lord, because you have declared victory over this, this realm, Lord, that we may trust in you and to always put our faith in you first and foremost. Um, thank you for all the great things you do for us today. Ask that you just be with us during the study, that this message be, uh, be beneficial to, to, to those who hear. Thank you again for all you do in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So, so just to kind of give you guys a running start, last week we were talking about Joshua, his call over his life. Uh, we know that Joshua was Moses' successor, and it wasn't like Joshua just assumed you know, leadership. He was he was being discipled under Moses himself, and so all these years of him being under the wing of Moses, to now whenever he passes away, now he's the new leader of this these uh, of this group. But we uh, last week we talked about how God called Joshua. You know, the, the, the one of the most infamous verses in all of Joshua is uh, Joshua's um, or God's call over Joshua to tell him to be strong. And and he reminds him time and time again, you know, you're about to go into this, enter into this land that I promised all the way back to Abraham. And now it's about to go to you. So I can go into this, this uh, group into the promised land, you know. And this is a very pivotal moment here for the history of Israel because now they're about to enter into their land that God has promised them. We see in chapter 2 where they, Joshua sent spies. You know, we see how a woman named Rahab was uh, hid those spies. They protected them from being caught. God honors that. And, of course, we see in chapters 3 through 4, they they make it into the promised land. But before they do, it marks uh, the, the crossing at the Jordan River. And we see them entering into the land on dry land um, when God parts the river. And we, we made the comparison between how Moses... Uh, parts the Red Sea and the Jordan River, and so, but before, as soon as they crossed into the Promised Land, we we talked about how they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. That was the first thing to enter into the land. It's it, it was a it was a, a, a message to say God goes first and we follow Him, and so that's where we left off last week. But uh, here a chapter we're going to be uh, talking about today is going to be found in Joshua chapter 5. So if you have the Bible, if you can turn to uh, the book of Joshua chapter 5. And we're going to be uh, reading this section here. And and if anybody has that verse, if they could uh, read for me uh, Joshua chapter 5 uh, verse 1. Jordan, all the Canaanite kings along the coast, 
Thank you. So, right here when we when we reach verse one, what what kind of sticks out to you? What was what's the? I guess if you were to read verse one, um, we we read about the, the kings, the Amorites, and the Canaanites. All the kings, actually, as a matter of fact, um, you know, they hear about the the news of the Israelites crossing into their land. But what 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 verse? Or uh, there was there was a certain thing that sticked out to me when I heard this. But I don't know if you can help me identify it. But what what sticks out to you in verse one? Um, the fact that all the kings heard about what the Lord did, and it sort of. It sort of intimidated them. Like it made them lose spirit, like the verse says. Mm -hmm. There was intimidation there uh, when, when Israel came. Yeah, and so you used the word intimidation. Do you remember, and let's rewind the clock back 40 years prior. And in fact, we'll go there right now. Um, you can go back and read uh, Exodus chapter 15. And this is not the first time the Israelites... Uh, encounter the, the, the Canaanites and the Amorites because 40 years prior when when Moses sends out 12 men to go and spy out the land if you go back and read in Exodus chapter 15 you notice there was only two men that uh, say surely we can we can do this we can go and we can we can take this on God has God has told us to go the only two people that had the faith to go and say that we can do this were Caleb and Joshua and now 40 years later we see this same event unfold we see Joshua is now the one leading these uh, the, uh, leading the, the Israelites into the promised land but this time instead of the the if we go back in Exodus we see how the 10 other men they were intimidated by the size of the these these, Am these Amorites and Canaanites, and in fact, you read and they say, we appear like grasshoppers in their eyes. And so they only were seeing the, the size and the stature of the, of the people. That was the only thing those 10 men saw. But Joshua and Caleb, they saw something as an opportunity for us to go into the land that God has promised us. And so the intimidation, when you do the contrasting between these two encounters, you see how one group is intimidated by the you know the people living there the inhabiting that land the Canaanites and the Amorites and now 40 years later when they go again to go into enter into the land now who's intimidated now it's not the Israelites it's the all the kings and of the Canaanites and the Amorites so it's we see a reversal happening between uh, it and that's that was the one that sticked out to me the most. We saw that uh, we saw all the kings of the Canaanites and the Amorites. They were uh, they, and it says right here the key verse right here. It says their hearts melted. Now, what does it mean when it says the, their hearts melted? Like, I mean, their their hearts did it? I don't know. Did it soften? Like, what what do you what do you take that to mean when it says their hearts melted? They had chocolate hearts. They had chocolate hearts. <laughs> Interesting point, brother. Can you expound? <laughs> no, when um, when it says their hearts melted, we actually uh, go back to chapter 2 of Joshua. In fact, can somebody read to me Joshua chapter 2, verse 10 through 11? In fact, this is the, this is uh, whenever the spies, um, you know, they, they uh, Rahab hides the spies. But notice what Rahab tells the, the spies. Uh, in verse 10 through 11 of chapter 2. And if anybody's there, they can read. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water and the Red Sea before you. And when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Oz, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So right here we see a con we see a parallel uh, of 
chapter one or chapter five verse one and uh, in the previous chapter with Rahab. So the the Amorites and of the Israelites crossing into uh, across the Jordan and notice their hearts melted and that to me is it's a huge it's a huge uh, point to make because nothing has unfolded at this point keep in mind there hasn't been anything that's happened the only thing that they've uh, that has happened is that they hear of the of God parting the, the Jordan River and of course previous to that 40 years later uh, before was the Red Sea they they saw what happened with uh, the Egyptians but notice that the these kings all of the kings in fact they hear about what God did and they immediately they were they were they feared God that's basically when it means that their hearts melted it means that they were they feared God and it's not and, and to me I see a, a huge contrast between the old generation with with Moses how the, the, the Israelites were, they saw the, these miracles, they saw what God did to them. Uh, they, they led them out of the land of slavery into the, essentially it's supposed to be the, essential, the, the promised land, but because of their unfaithfulness, now the new generation has come up to Joshua, and now the Israelites take on a whole new uh, like, you know, feeling. You know, it's, they're more emboldened now because it's a difference of attitude when it comes to their approach with God. Uh, to answer your question, brother, uh, I think when they, when, when this scripture talks about their hearts melted, you, you notice uh, opposite of that, the scripture also talks about take heart, right? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, just being courageous, like have courage, right? And I think in, in this case, uh, that it's telling us that they lost their courage because of what they saw and what they heard. Yeah. Yeah, that, that courage was lost. I mean, the, the, and that cost them 40 years of being in the wilderness. You know, they lost out on that opportunity for them to go into the promised land. And God told them, because of your unfaithfulness, you will not see the promised land anymore. You, you will have to, uh, I will give that over to the next generation who will rise up and they'll, they're going to have, they're going to have the confidence and it's going to be led through Joshua. And I'm going to let him be the, the one to, to lead you into the promised land. But it, it, they lost that. I mean, and despite the many attempts through Moses, through Joshua, to encourage the Israelites to, to be courageous, and God, through miraculous ways of trying to save them, yet they could not find it in themselves to, to, to listen and to obey God's command. And ultimately, they lost out on that opportunity. Uh, but uh, now we see a new generation come up. Now Joshua is about to lead them in, but you see the contrast between uh, how the, the old generation responded to the Amorites and the Canaanites, and how it's it's shifted now. Now the now the fear and is uh, found through the Amorites and the Canaanites. Not the old generation of the Israelites only saw you know the stature of them, but now they were the ones who were fearful of the Israelites. And to me, you see the contrast between how one generation makes. And really, it, it relates a lot to, you know, just generations that pass. And I remember we were, uh, we read through um, through a class, you know, and there was this old Chinese philosopher who said, you know, um, hard times uh, bruise up strong leaders. But whenever, you know, we're in times, you know, that age can tend to be, you know, they, they can weaken because, you know, hard times produce strong men. But, you know, when times are fruitful, times are good, sometimes those strong men can, you know, can, they pass pass away, and then, you know, that new generation comes up, and of course, they're, they're weak men as a result, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's telling to see how one generation can, you know, be strong and courageous, and, you know, I, I think, too, about, like, generations that have come and gone, you know, we had generations of men who have stormed the beaches of Normandy, who went in knowing that they were sh it was a it was a, a bat it was a they were going in and it was a basically they were it was a an it was a a moment where they were sure they're gonna die I mean it was one of those moments that despite all that they went in courageously and now we compare you know the generation of today it's just night and day uh, but uh, any comments or questions so far about the passage 
so so as soon as they 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 cross in we hear of them their hearts melted and verses 2 through 12 through actually through through 9 it talks about the circumcision so it it, it it, so as soon as they, so God tells uh, Ish, uh, Joshua to to, uh, to to circumcise uh, these men, and of course, remember, whenever they, this a new generation has come up. So forty years have passed, and uh, we we see that happening in Exodus, where uh, God tells tells all of the men to circumcise, and so now this this practice, this this um, this covenant that God has placed over the Israelites, they're, re, they're redoing it again. So we see here through verses 2 through 9 that circumcising uh, all the men, uh, they're reinstating all of the, the rituals. We see in verses 10 through 12, the first Passover is in Canaan. So we, we see that uh, reinvigorated again. And, uh, and so God is reminding the Israelites, you are set apart. Remember these things. We're, we're, I, I'm doing this covenant again with now a new generation that's come up. They need to know the ways that the, uh, of their of their forefathers. We and so it's a reminder that they need to to, to start up that covenant promise that God had given to them. And so we see that happening verses two through uh, through nine. And again, the Passover, uh, they finally eat for the first time the produce of the land. Uh, all the times they were eating the manna from heaven. Now God, and we see it actually in verse 12 uh, in chapter 5, it says, And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. And so now it's that manna that they got for them into the promised land and they're finally enjoying that that first taste of the fruit and the produce of that promised land and so that that's what's essentially going on uh, throughout these verses so Joshua, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness, talking about the, you know, the children, yeah, in the wilderness after they had come from Egypt had not been circumcised, and so uh, a new generation has come and, come and gone, the generation of Moses, now the new generation of Joshua, and all the Israelites up to that point had not been circumcised, so it's that. That's mean, what it means the yes. second time, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And so uh, God is reinstating that covenant promise again uh, through this new generation. And so now, leading up to this point, I mean, a lot of things have happened. I mean, we saw throughout from the time when a when God promised Abraham that he would, you know, father a nation as many as the stars in the sky. Now, through generations, through Isaac, through Jacob, all the way to his son Joseph. Another 400 years have passed. Now, finally, Moses comes up. And he's about to live in the promised land, but then uh, his that generation of people did not have the obedience and the faithfulness to, to, to listen to God, and they had to wait another 40 years. Finally, now comes Joshua, and now he's going to be the one to fulfill that promise that God gave to Abraham those many years. And so this is a very important 
like molded for the, the history of Israel. Now they're about to inhabit their, their promised land. And again, we were, were reminded that the promised land was uh, in, actually in, in verse 6. He says, a land flowing with good honey. And so here it's it's the good land. God has promised to them. All they have to do is just obey God and, and let him t- uh, lead us into that land. And in fact, uh, it, they're even more emboldened now that they've been set, uh, now that their enemies are fearful of God. So much, how much more things can they got to do is just enact and follow and commit through that, uh, that thing. And so... Here we're we're about to see kind of unfold uh, what's going to happen, but um, we see here an interesting section here in chapter five. So we're going to read chapter uh, Joshua five, and we're going to talk on uh, a unique uh, event that happens right before anything unfolds. Uh, notice verses thirteen through fourteen, or through thirteen through fifteen. <coughs> Here, they, 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 the circumcision of the, the next generation happens. They eat of the produce. So now Joshua is about to go into uh, to take the, the, uh, the promised land. But before anything happens, notice what happens here. So, verse 13. Everybody there again? So when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So I'm going to pause right there, verse 13. So (coughs) here Joshua's, imagine Joshua, you're, you're, you're with Joshua. Let's just pretend like you're there in this, you know, this whole event. So Joshua's leading you to the promised land. And right before they, they get to where they need to go, a man wielding a, a sword, he draws a, uh, was standing right in front of him. So, you can imagine these Israelites are probably like, you know, it's like, all right, we finally, we're about to get into this land, you know, like, now we've, we've circumcised, you know, we've gotten to taste the first fruits of the land. All right, we're ready to go, let's go. And now, before they get into anywhere, right before they get to where they need to go, here's a man drawing his sword, right, in, standing right in front of Joshua. And, you know, you can probably imagine probably the mixed level of, you know, of, of emotions going on. Like, who, who is this man? Like, who is he? Is he, like, is he here to help us? Is he here to stop us? I mean, you have to kind of wonder what's, you know, what's happening. And, in fact, Joshua, he, uh, he, he confuses this man as, you know, uh, as this person as a man because, you know, we see examples of, you know, how... We see in Jacob when he was wrestling a man, which in fact it ended up becoming, you know, it was not really a man, it was it was God. But notice verse 14, and, he's, and when, when Joshua says, are you for us or for our adversaries, when he asks the man with the sword, and he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander, verse 15, of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place you are, you, where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And I'm going to talk about verse 15, and you already know where I'm going to lead, where I'm going to go with this. But again, so we see this man right here. Uh, Joshua confuses, but in fact, th- this man was actually the commander of, of the Lord's army. So this is almost an, an angelic being that Joshua encounters. And th- there was only two other instances where this happened. And if y'all know your, your Bible history, what were the other two events that you remember this event happening? The burning bush, the burning bush with Moses, that was one. Well, but like the, the actual, like this, uh, this man with the sword. Uh, so I'm kind of painting the, 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 the image of the man with the sword. There was only two instances where this happened. It was with Balaam's donkey. I was going to say the donkey that spoke. The Balaam, that, the donkey that spoke. And then, in fact, with, with David. In fact, uh, that was found in, I believe, First Chronicles chapter 21. And, again, the, the, the moments like this are rare in, in, in Scripture. You know, we, we read Scripture and we say, oh, okay, so God appeared. But, like, 
this is a big deal. I mean, this is the uh, commander of God's army coming to Joshua right before they're about to lead into the, the land. And uh, he's telling him, you know, like he asks him, are you for us and, or against us? But notice the way he responds, this commander of God's army. And you can imagine the level of authority this, this man carries, you know, he's like, you know, he's like the commander in general, you know, and, you know, you probably feel the intimidation, in, you know. In this situation, it would be an angel of the Lord, or it will be God in, in the form of a, or what, because it just refers to a man, and then they, he said that he's the a, um, commander of the army of the Lord. Would that be an angel? Would that would be, said that he was an angel? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been debated. Um, I mean, I, I, I take it to mean as an angel, but I open any sort of any other um, intakes if if it's somebody else. I mean, I, I to me when I read it appeared it was an angel of, of the Lord, you know, of His army. But um, I, I invite any sort of any commentary if anybody has a different view. Um, <clears throat> no, no, you should understand this right here as uh, as an epiphany of the Lord. In other words, this is this is a. Uh, this is an appearance of Christ, and in, 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 I'm, I'm I firmly believe it for several reasons. Uh, because it, it, when the Old Testament describes this figure not as an angel of the Lord, but as a man, we ought to sit up and take notice. Uh, it's very similar. It's very similar to when uh, Jacob is wrestling, right? With uh, if you go back and you look, the description is like a man. He's not just an angel. Uh, and uh, th that encounter, again, I believe, is is um, is uh, a manifestation of Christ, a uh, pre-incarnate Christ. Let me tell you one of the main reasons why we should take it that way. Look at verse fourteen. The man, uh, Joshua asked the man, right? You know, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but uh, neither. It's not just no, but neither. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. But who's the commander of the army of the Lord? Now, some people says, Well, maybe it's the archangel Michael, right? But notice what happens. Uh, uh, now I have come, right? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did what? Worship. 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 Go back and look anywhere in Scripture, anywhere. Mm -hmm. And whenever it's an angel of the Lord, they say, get up. I, I'm just an angel of the Lord. I'm just a messenger. And Goloss is a messenger. This figure accepts worship. Okay, so now... When you look uh, kind of like, okay, where else do we see this kind of image? Is there any description that can kind of give us this idea? Yeah, actually in, in Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, uh, starting in verse 11, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written uh, on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe uh, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So to me, there is a very clear, you know, so, and, and, and for a lot of Old Testament scholars, uh, they struggle with that. They say, well, no, we didn't even see Jesus until the incarn incarnation, right, when we see it in the Gospels. But no, like, for example, you ask me who I think that fourth figure is with uh, Meshach, Shadak, and Abednego. Yeah, uh, when you look at them in, in that furnace, to me, it's not just, it's not an angel, it says, and there's a fourth one like a man. So to me, I think that there are there are appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament. And why not? I mean, for in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he's, he's always been with us. Uh, so does that mean we shouldn't deny the, the, the miracle of the manifestation of God in the flesh, the, the incarnation? So we should we don't we don't deny that. Like that's yes, that's that's God becoming human, but that doesn't that doesn't negate that Jesus has made appearances in the Old Testament. So that's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, uh, imagery of Jesus there in the appearance, especially as they come in to take the Promised Land, which is indicative of, of later 
us going into the promised land in the in the in the a lot of the, they, they refer to the son of man you know we see in you know Ezekiel when you know Daniel they were described as this a figure as son of man so I, I, I can I, I see where you're going with it you know, as far as that yeah know. son of man uh, it, it means human so when he says Ezekiel a son of man he's saying human so when you see Daniel son of man human but Jesus takes that title for himself well why it's just the word human Jesus why because 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 it's it's an incredible uh in, it, it, he describes the incredible event well you're you're human yeah but god has now become one of us wow you know so now that simple word becomes something profound and 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 i wanted to go back to something else because this is beautiful because um which you're doing great on this because you know you talk about how you know they come in and the, the, the kings their hearts melt uh before them and i think that, that what what it makes us realize and it make, i was just hearing you bring this lesson i was thinking to myself it's really where we do what where we place two things in our life where do you place your faith and where do you place your fear that's really the two things because those like if you you, you said it very well the old generation they looked outward and they placed their fear in what they saw but they didn't see that the main thing god was with them that's the whole point of all of this uh, why did the king's hearts melt? Because not because their army was so fantastic, or because Joshua was such an amazing leader. Because they realized God was with them, and that's that's today. When when we stand and we place our faith and our fear, both our faith must be in God and our fear must be in God. And when you place it properly with God, then everybody before you will melt. Not because of who you are, but because the Lord goes before you. When you put God before you, He trailblazes the path that you follow man he blazes a trail for you and so we look and go wow look what i did no you didn't do anything you just followed the path that god blazed for you and so that to me is what i, I take from it yeah. um and remember joshua is the old testament rendition of yeshua you know what yeshua means jesus he's he's the old testament he's a he is a typology of christ and so what you see here is uh is an is an example joshua leads the people into the promised land jesus will lead the people into the promised land the spiritual promised land so there's this indication of that i love the insight here thank you no i think that was a great call out uh, that brother uh, irby shared right now because i know like when i read this i felt the same thing i thought maybe this was an angel because you know angels do appear right but that call out about that's it, right on point. I, I can see that totally. I my question is, do you do we think that Joshua realized that he was speaking to a member of the trilogy? I think so. I, think so. I, think so. I believe so. The yes. reply was, uh, what does my Lord say to the servant? Right. And then uh, and then the response back was take off your sandals from your feet. Uh, for this place where you stand is holy. That's you saw that with the burning bush. Exactly. exactly. But don't forget the most important thing he worshiped. Yeah. He experiences it, and his first thing is to worship. Yeah. That ought to tell you, you know. So, what does he do? Three things. He worships, he seeks the Lord's counsel, and then he is obedient to the removal of his sandals. He knows where he's, where he's standing. Man, I mean, we, we cannot. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. I think that we as Christians, we forget of the grandeur and the majesty of Christ. I love this stuff, man, because. Man, it just reminds me how majestic, how wonderful, how mighty, and how powerful our Lord and Savior is, man. Jesus is the King of Kings. And when you look around and you see all the mess around us, man, I I, I never want to <coughs> I, I, I I want the hair on the back of my head to always stand stand up every time I consider the mightiness, the grandeur of my Savior. And 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 that's what that reminds me of. And and my hair standing up right now, you know, it just, man, let, let us never stop, let us never fall out of love and out of awe of Christ. I mean, and because it's easy to do so, right? Because we go into church every Sunday, whatever, like, no, no, let me never fall out of that awe because, man. Uh, we we can how, to take for granted. Yeah, so that, yeah, uh, and how mighty he is, man, how mighty he is. And if we just remember that every day, man, we'll be fine. You know? Amen.
when we think of it like that, it's also a reminder to ourselves how small we are, yeah. how mm-hmm. minute we are, how it is that how we should depend on Christ for everything, mm-hmm. in everything, in right. all things. It, it goes hand in hand with that. Amen. It's amazing that humility. Amen. Yes. Amen to that. And so, you know, it's so we he talks to him about the, you know, about verse fifteen because. Here we see the echoing of in Exodus chapter 3 when God first calls out to Moses in the form of the burning bush. You know, he tells them exactly the same words, you know, for take off your sandals for your where you're standing is holy. And so I, 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 I love this. Um, I love this section right here. I, I think that this is a, a very important part of the story of Joshua because here we see where you know, Jesus comes and talk to Joshua, and he's, I, I, I think he came here to, to, to as a model of a final encouragement to him, right before he's about to enter into the promised land, he, he, he goes in to, to remind him, wait, hey, before you, before you begin to fight anything, do you think before you can do anything on your own, just remember, I am God, and your, your focus should be on the spiritual readiness before you even begin to prepare, you know, to fight military-wise. And so, so I, I believe that, you know, this was this final uh, final word that Jesus would personally come to, you know, appear before Joshua, before anything happens. And Joshua, so loyal and, you know, to, to God, he, he bows down and worships him. And if we do the same thing, I mean, God's going to fight our battles for us. Amen. I mean, yes. you know, if, if we were to just follow the same ways, it, it, God has promised us the victory over our lives. You know, he, he's going to fight our battles for us. You know, as long as we put our priorities uh, in God, he's going to he's going to win. I mean, we're, as long as we, we do that, we ha- we have the victory. And, and I, I think that's where our unity with with Christ can you know, can, can be so uh, strong when we just remember that. And so, um, to me, I, I think this is a, a great reminder for us as when we battle our personal uh, conflicts, our issues, we, we have to just remind ourselves that God, you know, He's declared victory. And, you know, as long as we prioritize Him, as long as we seek Him out, you know, nothing, no, no battle or no issue is too too great or uh, or too complicated for God. I mean, there's for him nothing is beyond his uh, his hand of reach. And to me, it, it's just a a, a a reminder for for Joshua, a, a final word of encouragement before he goes and embarks on this 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 journey that he will um, you know God will be with him. And so um, I, I, to me, I think this chapter five it could not be overlooked and I, I wanted to share that before uh, you know before we continued on but um, that, that's what I that, that's pretty much my study in a nutshell <coughs> of course there's a lot more to discuss but I think this pretty much encompasses the, the general you know message overall but uh, a, any other comments or questions yes well we got about five minutes which is perfect because now you kind of skipped over it so I'm gonna jump in on it here okay okay. Uh, uh, we're, since we're in Joshua chapter 5, man, we cannot overlook verses 9 through 12. Okay? So if we agree, and I think we do, that here we see a manifestation of Jesus, right? In his encounter with Joshua, right? Mm-hmm. I want you to read verses 9 through 12 in light of that. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Now, what does that mean? It means. It took me 40 days to get you to, to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took me 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Let me repeat that so you can really consider what I just said. All it took me was 40 days to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took me 40 years to get the Egypt out of Israel. And he's saying, okay, finally, the generation that could not let go of the past, that couldn't stop looking back, that couldn't place their fear in me, that couldn't place their faith in me, they're gone now. I've raised up a new generation, which is why now he's renewing this covenant that he initiated with Abraham, right? But notice now, 
On the evening of the 14th day of the month, which is Nisan, who while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, what did they celebrate? The Passover. <clears throat> What's the meaning of that? What's the Passover? It is the day in which they took the blood of the lamb. Is there any indication of that of Jesus? Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover. He is the blood of the lamb that, that has caused the angel of death to pass over us so that we may find eternal life, right? But notice, the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Now, I have a question for everybody. This is why it's so important to overlook this. Verse 12, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. So here's my question, everybody, because I don't know. I need everybody to tell me. <clears throat> um, why does the manna stop? What is the indication? What are, what are the implications of on this very day, Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry, God had been feeding the people of Israel manna for 40 years. And it was on this particular day that God says, on this day, the manna stops. Why? What do y'all think? Um, God, um, God is telling them now the land, you're in the land, now you will be able to, to sustain yourselves, like find a way. Okay. Anybody else? I, I like how in nine it says uh, he wrote away the reproach. Reproach, kind of like you can take the guy out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the guy. And I think that with the mana, like them taking the way of Egypt out of them, also with the way they used to eat, that God's taking that and changing that as well. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, and and. I mean, the, the provision of God now. I think whenever Jesus says man cannot live on bread alone, I think that is almost a connection oh, to that. There, there you go. What God is doing here is saying that the provision of which they have relied on, which was the manna that he had provided, has now been transferred into the land that they occupy. Is there a meaning for us? Absolutely. What he's saying to us here is that, you know, when... When, when we come to faith in Christ now, our faith in the provision of God is now found in the spirit that we receive. Yeah. And now that, that doesn't mean that God has to answer every prayer for us. That doesn't mean we have to get everything our way. The truly mature Christian understands that sometimes God's going to say no, or he's going to say not yet. But my provision is in the Lord. I don't need what God has. I need God himself. I don't, it's, 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 I'm not looking at what God can give me. How many Christians come or how many people come to church uh, why are you here? Oh, I, I, I need a, a new job or, or this crisis happened. And all they're looking at is their crisis. Well, can you look bigger than that? No, no, no. I, I need this, this, this. And then God answers that and then they're gone. Well, whenever Jesus fed the 5,000, they, you know, gave them bread and fish. And then again, the crowd comes looking for more. What are they looking for? They're, they're looking for the daily manna. Yeah. But you, get, you nailed it. You nailed it. Man cannot live on bread alone. That, that statement encompasses what's happening here. You know, well, what do we do now? Now you get to work. Now you be fruitful. I provided for you at a time when you didn't have and when you couldn't. But now I brought you here. Now it's your turn to be fruitful. So, so you nailed it. And that's that's this right here. This moment is 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 the epitome of what Jesus is saying whenever he says, "Man cannot live on bread alone." Well, why? Because because spiritual, I mean, a, a, a physical food is insufficient to provide for what you need. You need the spiritual spiritual nourishment. You now have to provide. You need now become fruitful in the land, and so that's there's a transition now. Now this land's going to feed you. Now you're going to get to work and do the things that you need to do, and that's what we do, for we were created to do good works. For, yeah, in Ephesians chapter two verse ten, for we were created to, for good works to produce good works. That's the fruit that we create. So when we when we embrace that man, then that's when we become that fruitful tree. And that's kind of what I said in my podcast, um, that if we're like trees. Uh, we can be these trees with a lot of leaves but no fruit, which is the whole purpose of why Jesus curses the fig tree. Um, what good is a tree that doesn't bear fruit? You know, and, and what God reminds us is if you're rooted in me, you'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can't do anything. I so. think it also speaks to that we are intended to work. Mm -hmm. And the welfare mentality is not a biblical one. It's they, they got the help when they needed it, but it was with the idea that at some point they were going to be able to support themselves, able-bodied, 
able to work, that type of thing, they don't, they don't need, they shouldn't count on also because then that becomes a source of a, a God, lowercase g, right? You're going to be loyal to the hand that feeds you, which may deviate you from your true um, creed. So I think that's a slippery slope as well. I think that's with the modern day Democrat versus Republican mentality, you know, let's keep them in chains type of thought. So it's a slippery slope there as well. And well, thank you guys for all those comments. And uh, we're, we're going to be getting into more into Joshua in the coming weeks. But again, I want to say those online. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, but um, before we close, um, I wanted to go ahead and say a word to close in prayer. So, Lord Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together for us to study your word, Lord. And Lord, how wonderful your word is that you would uh, personally appear to us, Lord, and walk with us, Lord. And you would carry and take away that sin that we may inhabit uh, your kingdom, Lord. That it was thanks to your son that died on the cross, Lord, that we have now that opportunity to, to encounter you. Thank you for all the goodness and all the, the, the insight that was shared. Lord, I, I pray for this church that the truth may be preserved and for us to be, as you call us, to be the salt and light. Thank you for all the goodness that you do. In your son's name, amen. 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 At this time, if y'all want to.